Well, welcome. It's so good uh, to have you with us. Happy New Year. Hope you've had uh, a good Christmas uh, wherever you are. We are going to be starting a new uh, series today, uh, looking at uh, what does the road out of Bethlehem mean? What does it mean uh, that Jesus came, but what impact does that have on our life? And does it change anything? And should it change anything? If you've got your Bibles with you, I'd love if you could turn to Romans uh, chapter 12. And we're going to be uh, in this chapter for a few weeks. Uh, if you don't have it, don't worry, it's going to come up uh, on the screen. And let me just read out from verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Lord God, we uh, come today and listen and receive and just hear what you have for us. Holy Spirit, would you fill us with all that you are? Lord, we ask, would you transform us in the way that you can so we can be about your, your kingdom work here in our city and our nation, we pray. Amen. If you've been around the church for any amount of time, I want to ask a question. Why? Why have you been around the church? Like, what is it that makes church something you do? If you've never really thought about that question, don't worry, I would hazard that doesn't put you in an exclusive club. I'm sure lots of people haven't thought about it. And don't get me wrong, I'm really happy you choose to do church. I love church. I'm firmly convinced that it's the way of Jesus. But I wonder, why? Why do we do church? And we could equally extend this thought to the rest of this passage that we see uh, that was read out. Why must we love? Why must we serve? Why must we be hospitable, bless people. Why? What's that about? We live in a cultural moment where people's view of the church is changing, where the perceived role and life of a Christian is being changed as well. The church is no longer a celebration. In people's minds, it's a dirty word. They're those loud people, those, those money-grabbing people, those corrupt, dangerous, judging people. And to be a Christian in our age is almost completely different to that of the New Testament. In the last 150 years or so, humanity has successfully created this kind of third category. You know, in the New Testament we look at, we have the followers of Jesus and the crowds. And that was it. And today we have followers of Jesus, those who are trying to grow like him and do what he did. And we have the crowds who don't care or don't yet care for him. But we've made this third category, uh, which we often call kind of, those, those who are Christians, but it means no radical change in what they do in their lives. They have this acceptance of Jesus might be continue with a, a continuation of everything else that marked their lives before they met him. In short, we've successfully created a category of humanity that can be called a Christian, but feels no compulsion to look to him or follow him. This is what we call cultural Christianity. And I would argue that one of the biggest reasons for this failure to ask, why do we do certain things as a Christian? or a failure uh, for some of these big why questions to be answered is a primary reason around this cultural Christianity. If we don't understand the story of Jesus, typically our response falls into, into a few different categories. If we don't understand the story, we get bored, disillusioned, hurt, damaged by the church, we stop. Like, I kind of believe in Jesus, but I don't really get this. It's painful, it's hurtful. Or we fake it. We feel like we're meant to do certain things that everyone else seems to know what they're, they're doing. Like, look around at these people in church. They seem to know what they're doing. So we just go along with it. Wow, these people seem to have really deep prayer lives. Or they go to church all the time. So I must go. I don't really know why, but I go. So often the case with cultural Christianity. Because it's prevalent in the culture, we do it. The danger with cultural Christianity is that culture always comes before Christ. So whatever is permissible in the culture becomes acceptable in our faith. In short, we take what we long for within our culture, wealth, earthly success, land, houses, jobs, whatever, and then we try and add Jesus in and fit him in somewhere around that. Or we use it kind of as a superstition. 
Uh, the way of Jesus is something that we kind of believe in, but alongside all the other stuff we believe in, alongside our witch doctor, our personal beliefs, the things we borrow from other religions and practices that we pick up along the way. In short, Jesus becomes something else we add into the way we do life and not the only thing. And typically when people are, are like this, they mark their faith by intensity rather than consistency. Like if I pray really hard, if I clench my butt cheeks and scream that God uh, will hopefully love me more or help me get rich or whatever. But it ultimately becomes about what we do and not who Jesus is. In these situations, people's faith is fueled either by cultural pressure, internal guilt, or some sort of sense of moral obligation. But each of these motivations is waiting for a moment, a, a, a moment when the pressure is taking off and they stop. They stop in their faith. They get stuck in their discipleship to Jesus. They, they finish with the church, like I'm done with this and more. I think for many people, the COVID season has been that moment where people have gone, uh, hang on, I'm not sure why I even go to church. I'm not sure why I'm a part of this. I'm not sure I believe in this stuff. Sure, I believe in Jesus, but what about the rest of it? All this is a, a, a long way of saying understanding is the basis of our faith. We must understand the key bits of our faith if we're to recognize what it means to be Christians. In this passage, it starts with therefore. This word, therefore, and when you see, therefore, a legitimate question to ask is, what is therefore, therefore? And in this book, it's a break. This therefore relates to all that Paul has been teaching about God and Jesus and the Christian truths for living in the light of that. And he's saying, now this impacts your life. This is the truth about who God is, who Jesus is. And therefore, this is what your life should look like. And we've got to recognize this is really key because so many of us jump to the therefore bits. We want to know where the action is. What are the bits I need to be doing? How can I get involved? What does my life look like? But Paul is saying, I'll only work properly first you know the reasons why. If you live in the truth of why we do this. I think this is why we have a generation who are just disillusioned. Because they hear about Jesus, they accept Jesus. We know so many have gone forward to, to accept Jesus at every altar call they've ever been to. But then they jump to, the, to, the, to the, what they're doing first. They jump to the moral and ethical actions without ever knowing what lies behind that. So people burn out on, on serving, on going to church, on prayer, on loving others. Why? It's not because they think these things are hard to do, though they are. But rather because we don't really see how this fits into the God story. So we slip into a cultural way of understanding our lives instead of a kingdom way. And as it turns out, this therefore in Romans 12, this little word, stands for an awful lot. And over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack what this therefore is. What is it that Paul outlines that suggests his people should be living this way? The way is described in chapter 12 as loving people, serving people, those who encourage and, and hate what's evil, those who honour others and practice hospitality, those who live in harmony, those who don't repay evil with evil, those who feed our enemies, those who live in peace. Because these are not normal characteristics, nor are they simply acceptable standards of human behaviour. This is a completely new way to live. A revolution has begun. And it flows out of this story. And this story has a distinct shape. And the shape will help us understand all that we're called to. So this therefore, what does it represent? Well, we are looking at the, the whole book of Romans to this point. And firstly, I think it's a recognition of what God has done. The life of of a Christian, Paul says here in verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. The life of a Christian, Paul says, is understood in view of God's mercy. The danger is, for many of us, we haven't taken the time to view what God's mercies are. And if we have, do we know what they mean? The first few chapters of, of Romans articulate this, that humanity was born into a story, and to be vision 
uh, vision, visionaries within that story, within God's kingdom, to be bearers of this story and partners with his work. And this was always the plan that we would partner with God. And this is the glory of God, but humanity exchanged it for their own desires and images, Romans 1, 23. And we're trapped, glimpsing what God wants for us, but with no way to get there. We're trapped in sin and idolatry, and we turn to what is not of God to worship things not of Him. And we become locked in a story that's far from where God wants us to be. We see this in our own world and in our own time in in the words of Romans 1 25 we're happy to exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship created things rather than the creator you know our Christianity has become so distorted that we're happy to believe in Jesus so that the destination on our ticket gets changed but it's not meant to change our life right now like we're happy to accept that we'll go to heaven but God keep your hands off my life right now this is my thing Because for many of us, we know we can't change where we go when we die. So we say, hey God, I want you to be in charge of that bit. But we're convinced that we know better for our life right now. You know, God is not saying your dreams and ambitions don't matter. But he is saying, don't cheapen yourself by worshipping those dreams when you could worship the one who created them. But God responds to this situation in humanity. He sends his son, Jesus, because we can't sort ourselves out. And because God's mission is that we regain what we are meant to be. Jesus comes to be what we are, trapped and guilty in sin, so that we can become in part what Jesus is. Jesus isn't a mere cancelling of the bad things. This is a restoring of what it means to be fully human. This is the language of 12 verse 1, to be a living sacrifice. A people who are holy and pleasing to God. It's to grasp the reality of God's mercy. And earlier in Romans it says, when Jesus rose to life, he overcame our brokenness by resurrection life, the life he then offers to us. Tom Wright says this, Jesus rose again and God's whole new creation emerged from the tomb, introducing a world full of new potential and possibility. Indeed, precisely because part of that new possibility is for human beings themselves to be revived and renewed, The resurrection of Jesus does not leave us passive or helpless spectators. We find ourselves lifted up, set on our feet, given new breath in our lungs and commissioned to go and make new creation happen in the world. And a recognition of what God has done leads us to an understanding of of justification is the language. Declaring humanity to be right before God. Being able to take our place. As we become part what Jesus is, we become, to use the technical term, justified. Which means we're declared righteous or we're right before God. And justification is a huge topic, but in Romans it essentially suggests three things. That we have a new status, we're forgiven and we're right with God. We have a new family, we're included into God's people and God's people's mission. And we have a new future that transformed life within us is going somewhere and extends beyond here and now. And this going somewhere is an invitation. Finally, we see that this is an invitation into the story of God and his kingdom. And as we end, we come back to the words that were read out earlier in the message version of Romans. So here's what I want you to do with God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So what does it look like to be the people of God? The generation we live in is marked by greed and corruption, war, famine, and perhaps even close to home we see an increase in brokenness, in mental health crisis, suicide rates rising, marriages breaking up. 
people surrounded by other people but feeling desperately lonely. The church losing its place in society. You know, trust me when I say the church has a dirty name in our city. The moment you say to someone, hey, we'd like to do a church here, they go, no, thank you. The church hasn't been a beacon against the bad practices of our city. It's been synonymous with them. I've met with people all the time who say, the church did this, the church stole this, or the church hurt this. What is our vision for going forward? This vision, I suggest, is that we become a people of flourishing, of loving, of community, of contribution. Are we going to be leading the way forward culturally into a new, fresh way of being human amidst the angst of our postmodern society? And if we took seriously the call that we're becoming new people, if we were training and developing, listening to the Spirit, worshipping in all of who we are, we would see our nation transformed. The biggest threat, I believe, to God's kingdom in our time is not the rise of secularism, but the rise of Christianity. A Christianity where accepting Jesus means nothing in our everyday life. What will Jesus coming out of Bethlehem mean for us? What does Jesus mean here and now? We're going to put up some discussion questions. You might just want to reflect on them with who you're uh, watching with or just uh, think about them on your own. But thanks so much for joining us. I just want to say, 
you get the glory you get the glory you get the praise you get the praise and you take the honor you take the honor i just want to say